Hi everybody, welcome. My name's Julie Roberts and I'm the Senior Manager of the Social Enterprise Group at RMIT. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered here tonight and pay my respects to the Elders both past and present. On behalf of the Social Enterprise Group at RMIT and Bank MECU, our partners in creating tonight's forum, welcome to you all and thank you for coming along tonight. It's lovely to see you all here. Tonight we're also aiming to shine some light onto a fascinating topic, the question of the ways in which the plethora of new modes of communication, Twitter, Facebook, texting, Pinterest, to name but a few, the way in which they impact upon the capacity of the masses to bring about change. It seems, it appears, that it's easier than ever before to actually have a say, to express what we believe in, to express what we think is right or wrong or good or evil and, and have our say. And tonight we've uh, assembled a fantastic panel of men, and I'll refer to that gender issue in a moment, um, to discuss this topic. Each of our guests has been invited because of their impressive expertise and knowledge in the field of communication. And we've gone to some lengths to try and get a panel together that will give us a diverse perspective on this topic. So we're pretty excited about having a, um, uh, the range of people here that we do have. John Fain, who's chairing our discussion tonight, is well known to all of you. John hosts the highly successful and popular Conversation Hour on 774. And I know it's a bit of a joke amongst my friends and I that, oh, did you hear about blah, blah, blah? I was on the Conversation Hour. <laughs> so it certainly feeds a lot of our discussions. Um, and although John is really well known, I googled him of course, as you have to these days, but I think his official bio says it all, where it states that John is known for his provocative and probing debate, quick wit and willingness to ask the stickiest of questions. And I'm sure tonight we're going to see his capacity for insight and intelligence in action. John's going to introduce you to our panellists, but I'd also just like to take this opportunity to quickly thank Paddy Manning, Dr Peter Chen and Sam McLean for agreeing to be with us tonight, to be our guests. So before handing over to John, I'll comment quickly on our all-male lineup. It's always our objective in these forums to uh, obtain appropriate gender balance, and we did try to attain that tonight, but unfortunately, the women who we invited to be our guests were not able to join us. So the absence of women doesn't mean that there were no women experts in this area or that we didn't seek out women. It's simply that those that we invited tonight were not able to make it. So I'm calling upon the female members of the audience here to ensure that if the conversation drifts into an area that's a bit too blokey or seems to be ignoring the female perspective, that you use the opportunity of question time to speak up and be heard. And be heard you will tonight, regardless of whether you're a man or a woman. We're counting on the people's voice to form a significant part of this discussion. And just to say once again, thank you very much for your attendance. Enjoy your night. I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Over to you, John. Thank Thanks, you. Julie. The breadth of the discussion, well, who knows where it's going to go. Um, in the short time we've had, just before we've gathered here in the microphones, we've found a, an extraordinary range of topics that could well easily slot in to the title that we've been given tonight. And we, we could talk about everything from social change in China to trolling and flaming on the internet through to whether or not Bernie Brooks wishes social media wasn't as quick in addressing some of his remarks and what that cost Meyer, for instance, or Eddie Maguire and so on. There's so much that could be included. And Paddy Manning, Peter Chen and Sam McLean, I'm sure will each be more than, uh, more than wonderful guides as we tour around such a rapidly changing and rapidly evolving landscape. My two bobs worth before we start. Uh, when we talk about media, I'm always terribly wary, as I'm sure each of our participants and many of you in the audience will be. Um, media can describe all sorts of things. Yes, I work in the media. I work for the ABC and I work on the radio. I'm on air three and a half hours a day from 8.30 till 12 and five days a week. That means I'm on air for thousands of hours and thousands of interviews every year and I've been doing that now for 17 years in this shift and 25 years across different media at the ABC. I don't think what I do has too much in common with Today Tonight. I don't think 
what we talk about has much in common with a current affair. It's all media. So when we talk about the media do this or the media do that, I always bristle. In fact, it shits me to tears because I don't want to be put in the same basket. I share nothing in common with those other media outlets. I don't even share the same values as them. The only thing we have in common maybe even is some part of the technology. That's all. Our worlds don't overlap. They almost never collide. And yet that's all the media. So let's drill down. Let's uh, try and unpack it a bit for you. We've got three very able participants to do that. Sam McLean is from GetUp, and maybe I'll ask you to tell us just a bit about yourself first, a bit about GetUp, and what you make of the issues that have brought us to the, to the stage at Fed Square tonight. Thanks, John. Uh, well, GetUp is uh, probably the best place to start, and GetUp is a movement of, of Australians from across the country and uh, who get together online to, to take action together to hold politicians accountable and, and have a say in our democracy. They're 55% um, of them women, unlike our panel tonight. Um, and their average age is about 50. So they're, they're maybe not the, um, the young, uh, young blokes that you might imagine they are if you're just looking at me. Um, they're spread right across the country and, um, and believe in a whole different bunch of, uh, of values and, and campaigns. So our model is that um, people can jump online and participate in those campaigns they believe in and, and take a pass in those they don't. Um, Today we're, we're doing a survey of, of those members to invite them to rate their, um, their priorities for this election and which issues they'd like us to campaign on and how they'd like to participate. But we imagine that, um, we, we anticipate that 20,000 GetUp members will uh, participate on the ground over the next three months to the election, handing out scorecards on issues that are important to them at the polling booths or, uh, or uh, volunteering to talk to people in their community and roll them to vote uh, or donating online or contacting their politicians. They might also be um, you know, making their own political TV ads or, or voting on those of others uh, to prioritise which ones we fundraise to put on air. Uh, that's, that is GetUp in a nutshell. Uh, we kind of formed, uh, I guess, in 2005 in response to what was really a kind of uh, an environment where there were lots of, of protest movements around in Australia. You can remember walking across the Harbour Bridge in Sydney for reconciliation or the huge marches uh, here and across the country against the Iraq war, uh, demonstrations about uh, the way we treat asylum seekers, which obviously have had a huge impact and, um, and we're doing a lot better on that now. Um, and um, there were largely the same people who were coming out to all these different moments of protest. And I guess our, our vision was to, um, to provide some some binding, some ligaments that keep those, those people together and turn those moments of protest into a movement um, that can address multiple issues. Um, that's Get Up. I, I came to Get Up when I was um, uh, kind of younger, uh, longer haired, uh, greener, um, uh, young, young man of 19. Uh, I walked into the office when um, uh, I saw Get Up was running a campaign about David Hicks and I saw um, uh, a big billboard that they were running uh, on the entry to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And I looked him up and walked into the office and said, I'd like to help. Um, and like, uh, like many of us, I was kind of volunteering most of my time and they haven't managed to get rid of me since. So that's you, that's Get Up. Now the issue that brings us here today, to what extent is Get Up trying to simply be a mirror or to what extent is Get Up trying to be a, an actual weapon of social change? A weapon, a weapon of social change. Um, uh, I wouldn't describe it so violently, but I think that, the, that that's more apt. I think um, you know, GetUp is a movement that is about values. We believe in, in environmental sustainability. We believe in uh, social justice and economic fairness. And we're not just about providing anybody with a platform uh, to have a spray about politicians and how they suck. Um, we're about promoting those values and getting outcomes. That means we look for campaigns where there is uh, an opportunity to really tip the balance, uh, where there's an opportunity for people to get together and, and have a considered thoughtful theory of change of how we impact an issue. Uh, so I guess in, in, in as much as you'd describe it as a weapon, uh, GetUp is about harnessing our ability to, to collaborate online using the internet so that instead of just shouting at Q&A at, at night, um, we, can, um, we can get together and kind of mob up with, with 10, 20, 100,000 other people uh, to, you know, start with signing a petition, take it to um, taking action on the streets, take it to raising money to put ads on air and fight back against the interests like the, like the mining industry um, who use that tactic all the time. 
Let's rattle off a few. You mentioned before the street protests about the Iraq war. Well, we didn't exactly have much impact okay. there. Um, we could go on to refugees and asylum seekers. You've been very active on that front and I can't see any particular progress in the direction of your activism, if anything, in the opposite direction there. Um, you can get the drift of what I'm going through. I'm just wondering if we went through and had a look at all the things that you've been involved in, at what point can you say to us, well, this one actually worked? Look, I'm, I'm sorry that we haven't, uh, we haven't won on the, on the asylum seeker front. <laughs> I'll take personal responsibility for that. But look, I think there are, the GetUp members, when they get together, sometimes you know, we, we throw ourselves at issues that are very important and that we, that we don't yet win. And asylum seekers is a really good example. Um, and um, that doesn't mean we should stop doing it. Um, that means that when uh, politicians take those asylum seekers and lock them up on, on Manus Island where we can't see them, uh, we don't stop protesting just because we're unlikely to win in the next month. Uh, we keep going because the principle is important. Uh, but there are a number of issues where you can look at um, get up members and social campaigns online having a really massive impact. So think about, for example, the David Hicks issue. When I walked in the doors at get up um, as that my first day, um, you know, they said, Sam, great, I'm glad you're here. Um, we've got a campaign for you to get stuck into. Um, it's called Bring David Hicks Home. Um, and 11% of Australians in polls at that time identified with that statement, we should bring David Hicks home. Uh, nine months later, through activism, not just by, by GetUp, of course, but by Amnesty and Terry Hicks and, and um, through journalists who are working on the issue, that had changed from 11% to 67% of people saying that they agreed that David Hicks should face a fair trial in Australia. A real huge shift in public opinion. Um, and I think that um, that was due to, to public campaigning, coordinated um, in large part through the internet where people were able to get together and generate the biggest petition the country had ever seen to run national advertising campaigns and support those MPs and senators who are willing to speak out on the issue. Uh, mental health is another great example of where um, GetUp members were able to take something that wasn't on the agenda at all. Um, in fact, our campaign started because before the last election there was a debate on healthcare, a two-hour debate, and neither party mentioned mental health once. Um, so GetUp members were able to get together with Pat McGorry, who was the Australian of the Year at the time, 120,000 person pe um, petition, nearly a half a million dollar advertising campaign, 150 vigils, candlelight vigils across the country in local communities, and, um, and really swing the issue around. And we saw, to their great credit, the coalition come out with the first policy on that uh, $1.6 billion commitment to mental health funding increase. And, uh, and two years later, after a lot of campaigning and hard work by people like Pat and members across the country who had a lot of skin in the game because they had, they'd seen the impacts of it on their families, uh, we saw the government announce $2.2 billion in increase. I think that was a result of, of great campaigning. Okay, and you'll claim that one, but whether that stands up to scrutiny, for instance, I suspect that tabloid television or newspapers would probably claim it, and so would a whole lot of other, I mean, government advertising campaigns, uh, you know, how you we apportion can, can it. Share. Let's let's get to talk about that a little further down the track as well. Our next speaker in the middle, Paddy Manning, business journalist. Paddy, tell us a bit about yourself, why you're here, and what you make of the topic. Uh, well, um, thanks, John. I'm, um, I had 15 years as a, bi a business journalist, um, mainly in, well, exclusively in print. Uh, I launched a magazine called Ethical Investor um, in 99, 2000. Uh, so I've kind of got an interest in the issues of, you know, social enterprise and so forth. Um, I've spent 15 years working at, you know, after Ethical Investor at the Australian and the Fin Review and the Asian and the City Morning Herald um, on the business desks of each of those newspapers and tried along the way to look at, um, you know, alternative ways of um, reporting uh, on covering, investigating uh, business, which is, you know, sometimes where I think the real power is in our society and uh, and I'd have to say I find that that's increasingly difficult. Um, I've watched as, uh, you know, what was really, in, you know, when I first turned up at the Oz in 1998, um, there was one modem on the news floor at Holt Street. Literally there were the queues of journos to uh, get onto that one terminal that had a modem so they could send an email, which is pretty hilarious. And uh, nowadays, you know, a print journalist um, at, you know, the age of the Sydney Morning Herald has to try and uh, tweet, um, you know, file a breaking yarn online as soon as possible, um, come up with some analysis or, you know, a breaking view, which is a new concept. 
and um, and uh, and then turn around and use sort of the next day's paper and do it all again. And and of course, um, also in that time, you know, the mainstream, the business model for mainstream media has completely collapsed, as everybody in this room would know. And uh, and you've also got an ascendant uh, uh, business. Uh, lobby or, or sector, if you like, uh, that uh, I think is taking advantage of um, the collapse of the mainstream media to um, sue uh, weaker media companies uh, and uh, buy them off uh, uh, with advertorial, so the separation of church and state that used to be um, sacrosanct in, uh, you know, newspapers like um, The Age and Sydney Morning Herald and uh, Canberra Times and you know all the Fairfax papers and you know also to you know to a degree in the tabloids, uh, a lot of that uh, you know the arguments are um, are losing now because you know the the, the media companies need the money uh, more than they ever have. You've got um, you know journalists being laid off um, by the hundreds uh, certainly at Fairfax last year, uh, so you've got more work to be done by fewer journalists. And, uh, and, and I think particularly where journalists come up against business, you've got a particularly um, uh, hostile environment and uh, I think the media is um, in danger of losing uh, there in, in terms of doing its job of the proper scrutiny of uh, business. And I think um, I was just saying downstairs a second ago that um, I thought even even last night on Q&A, we saw a bit of evidence of that with um, the editor of the Financial Review and Cora Senator Cory Bernardi just shouting down uh, Bill McKibben on climate change, really the idea that um, Australia might, uh, you know, wind back its proposed expansion tripling of, you know, coal exports uh, is shouted down as, um, as madness uh, when, in fact, we're confronting a climate change problem that um, is only getting worse and, the, the, and, uh, and yet it's very hard to get up and I have some personal experience of this to, to get up to, uh, to get up uh, to get up stories that question whether Australia should you know continue to rely on uh, fossil fuel exports so um, I'm very interested in how you, you know social and particularly now that I've got more time to tweet and um, uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram and everything else. Um, I'm particularly interested in how social media can be used to, you know, take take up the, um, you know, perform and, and enhance the traditional role of media as as a watchdog on business. And okay. Can I tap into your expertise? Uh, traditional reporting requires that um, you find a what you think is a story, you research it, investigate it, source a quote, verify it, and confirm what you're going to print and then it gets printed. Now, of course, with 24-7 news coverage, in particular for breaking news stories and competition amongst agencies for eyeballs on websites, it's got to be constantly refreshed, it's got to be constantly changing, it's got to be theatrical and once over lightly. And there's a phrase we use now in the industry was, which is uh, on, for online, if we're wrong, we're not wrong for long. How do you think that fits in with the ethics that the profession is subscribed to and the trust, therefore, that we have, the only reason anyone takes any notice of anything that any of us do is because they're going to trust what they're reading, hearing, seeing, tweeting, whatever it might be. What does it do to that? I think, I think it's a steamroller and, and um, journalism is the opposite of journalism and uh, pretty soon, uh, you know, it might seem that, um, yeah, you're hitting, you know, you're kicking some goals as a journalist by, you know, putting out more content. But um, I think the hunger in the, um, uh, you know, in amongst the public is is not for, um, you know, a, a a rewritten version of something they've already read or a uh, but but proper research. And I think um, so. Websites like the Conversation, where you know the reader has some faith that the person that they're hearing from has actually done some research into the topic that they're writing about and knows something about it. I think that's a real challenge to, um, you know, mainstream journalists who are trying to cover the ground but just not getting the time. And this, the, the, the simplest definition of journalism anyone's ever come up with is it, it's um, telling stuff that other people don't want told. Mm. And there's less and less of that now because more and more of it's pre-digested, spun, 
put out by press release, Absolutely. planted or seeded as a special favour or, or a, uh, a trade. Yeah. Well, don't get me started on spin. I mean, that the, the number of PRs, it's just volume. I don't think they're particularly brilliant or necessarily, um, you know, smarter. They just outnumber you so heavily <laughs> that um, you spend half your day um, dealing with them, answering their phone calls. Did you get my email? Yes, I did get your email. I didn't. I deleted it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, don't ever, you know, I've had, I've actually sat next to my old, one of my old editors used to go, if you ever ring me again and ask whether I got your email, you know, it's an absolute, he, he was, uh, he was uh, feral, you know, I mean, he used to eat PRs for breakfast, but you have to, because otherwise you don't get your job done. And, uh, and yeah, I just think it's a deluge and, um, and the public doesn't even know what it's missing. Uh, because, although they do, because they do switch off, you know, gradually they switch off from, oh, you find that the audience numbers for the age are falling. And you go, I wonder why that is, you know? And, uh, and it's because you can't get to do the job that you are being paid by the reader to do. And the reader doesn't know it, except that they do know it, and they don't find the paper worth buying anymore. Okay. We'll come back to whether you can do investigative journalism on Twitter somewhere further down the track. I'm sure it'll come up. Peter, tell us a bit about yourself, why you're here and what you make of the topic we've got. Sure. So um, I'm uh, Peter Chen. I'm a, a lecturer in politics and uh, media politics at the University of Sydney. I'm the author of Australian Politics in a Digital Age, uh, a recent um, book uh, on this topic. Uh, mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, published through the ANU ePress, one of the new generation of academic publishers, which is open content provided free to the public. Um, and uh, in a sense, like the conversation where the, the gap in the, the high quality, information rich sort of material that we're losing out of the commercial media sector is being replaced by other organisations when they're evil corporations, we call them PR flax and spin. Uh, when they're university organisations, we see that as sort of public service, to some extent the conversation's public service journalism. I do listen to Patty and I feel the, uh, the cold hand of the grave coming out over my shoulder. Um, certainly universities have been one of those uh, institutions that has uh, uh, survived the information revolution well, but with the rise of things like uh, massively open online courses and distributed courseware and things like that, uh, increasingly we are going to go the way of journalists where um, we are simply going to be churning out degrees uh, and not doing the sort of research. So if the conversation is the stopgap in, uh, in the information deficit that we have in society today, um, those stopgaps are under pressure too, and I think that's an interesting conversation we could have. Certainly, I mean, I've researched um, the relationship between new media and politics since about uh, 1997, uh, and I've seen a lot of these debates come and go over the years. Um, and to some extent, they tend to wax between uh, incredibly optimistic, you know, the Arab Spring or e-democracy, and the terribly pessimistic, uh, that it's the end of uh, journalism as we know it, uh, total domination by new mega corporations, evil Google or Apple or Microsoft, whoever's evil at the uh, particular time we're talking about. I think it is interesting that uh, in the last uh, financial year, uh, music sales went up for the first time in almost a decade, which I think does show that actually the public is interested in content. They are interested in paying for content and they will pay for content um, if they have the capacity to do so. And I think if we do take a sort of longer term view, we can see that certainly we are in a very interesting time with regards to the changing industrial and institutional arrangements with the communication environment that we have, but it's not unique. Um, certainly we have seen times that there has been a massive expansion in communication, uh, the printing revolution, and society changed and society adjusted. Um, we do have a, a crisis, I think, in confidence that the public has with regards to uh, journalism and PR and spin. But I think we will evolve new social and political conventions, possibly new organisations, which will fill those gaps. And I, I do think of the, the story of the development of the byline. Um, the byline as a journalistic enterprise was invented during the American Civil War because of the low quality of information about the war that was being distributed at that time. And so the industry responded. They invented this thing that now journalists couldn't live without, the byline, their own personal brand, to say, this is why you should trust what I say. 
So I think we'll develop responses to this period of interesting change. If we distill what's going on with social media, is it not just a new form of storytelling, just using different devices? If we distill it down to its absolute essence? No, I don't think it is. I, I think it is, it is something new. And, and often people will say, you know, social media is BS because it's just Twitter and what can you do in 140 characters? Or it's just Facebook, it's people looking at videos of uh, cats playing piano or whatever. The, the power of social media is not in uh, the channel, it is in the social grid. It is in the way in which it networks together. And it is the incredible plasticity of the communicative environment that we're in. We are both producers and consumers, judges and curators. We communicate one to one, one to many, many to many, many to few, few to few, and onwards and onwards. It is a different form. And we're going to develop over time different communicative languages. Um, but that is not fast. A lot of the questions that people put to me are oh, having a website, how many votes do you get? Or, um, you know, we didn't get Coney, so is this all a load of BS? Are we generating a, uh, a generation of young people who have no memory and no political interest because they're just playing World of Warcraft? Um, these are all very short term, short term, you know, uh, examples of what is often social change, an incredibly long term process. Uh, and it's not all unidirectional. We've become more com progressive at times in society and less progressive at times in society. It's not linear, it doesn't go in one direction, and it's not overly determined by the technology of the day. When the printing press was invented and books and magazines and flyers and leaflets went from being individually written to being capable of being mass produced, it was the religious institutions that first harnessed the potential where do you see the, the most likely power? Is it going to be a get up grassroots thing? Is it going to be a media empires, media barons, the Murdochs of this world, or the Googles, as you said before, who are going to harness the capacity? Or might it be something else that we've not yet even perhaps seen? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think the premise we need to, it, certainly it was, I mean, the Bible was something that was printed straight away, but that fed European Protestantism. It was a challenge to the institutional power of the Catholic Church. So in a sense, uh, it empowered a very different sort of political religiosity. The, the, the Gutenberg Bible says that you can have a direct personal understanding of Christ, your saviour. Whereas before that, the Catholic Church said, you can only know salvation through our institutional structure. So while, yes, it is going to be institutions, new forms of institutions, revised forms of old institutions, that always have the human financial positional resources to take advantage of technological change, even if they stumble initially. So, you know, Murdoch buys MySpace, not necessarily the greatest deal. Not, but, a, not a great initiative, no. But and... would you bet against Murdoch's long-term position online? I don't know if too many people would. Um, to some extent, it is going to be those institutions that will be powerful. Now, they'll be powerful because they can harness the social grid, not necessarily because they can command like they once did audiences and constituencies. So it's the same, but it'll be nicely different too. And that's a wonderful justification for continuing to fund higher education. And <laughs> uh, anyway. A little bit of self-interest <laughs> sneaking through, I'm hardly surprised. Thank you. Sam, you were recently at a session with Joe Rosbars. Joe Rosbars was Barack Obama's chief digital strategist. He was in Australia visiting Sydney for the Sydney Writers Festival. What did you learn from uh, the sessions that you attended where he was speaking? Mm. So, so Joe ran the digital campaign for the Obama uh, for the Obama re-election, um, and actually went back to to the Howard Dean campaign, which was a little bit less successful, but more, actually more innovative. Um, I think w one of the things that um, that we asked Joe when he came into the office um, to talk to us was was about you know what are the apart from you know how, how do we raise more money um, was about um, you know what were the most powerful. Uh, examples of social change, of social media being used for actually changing votes or, or having meaning, really meaningful um, kind of electoral implications. And um, I think that the, the, the major lesson out of the Obama campaign is not the medium. It's not 
you know, Obama had Facebook and, um, and online fundraising, therefore he won. Um, it wasn't the medium at all, it was the messenger. It was that in local, local electorates that mattered, where votes swung, the Obama message was being delivered not by you know, a video or by some you know, polished politician out of DC, it was being delivered by your neighbour um, who was knocking on your door um, saying, I'm, I live in your neighbourhood, um, I, you know, I'm voting for change because of this um, and somebody who you could connect with. And what was really powerful about social media for their campaign was not you know, that it allowed Obama to tweet to 56 million people or whatever. It was that it allowed them to coordinate um, local people to talk to local people in a one-on-one -on -one way. So that as uh, you know, a, a voter in, in Melbourne, um, you, know, you could log, in, log into the system and see who are the other voters in, in my district, in my electorate in Australia, who, um, who are undecided, who maybe haven't enrolled to vote, haven't registered to vote, and I can go and knock on their door and say, hey, neighbour. That's in an environment where voting isn't compulsory. How does it translate to Australia where voting is compulsory? What tricks have you got up your sleeve? Well, in the United States, they're using this to do primarily to do voter turnout rather than persuasion, because uh, if you're running a presidential campaign there, the easiest thing to do is to mobilise people who are amenable to voting for you rather than to persuade people who are undecided. But it, it, it equally applies in Australia, where the most persuasive um, conversations you can have on an issue um, that can change people's minds are uh, not them you know, seeing um, some politician on the news, but them having a conversation with their neighbour, and that can change votes. In an election like this one in Australia, where, where one in three people are telling pollsters that they're undecided, um, you know, that could be incredibly powerful. Um, but it's not just at the... At the um, you know, on your doorstep level when somebody's knocking on your door. It doesn't happen that much in Australia. Um, it's, also, it's, it, it's also about our interactions online. The same effect um, plays out on Facebook. You know, our news used to be curated by editors, right, who would sit, sit next to Paddy and, um, and shout at people. And largely our news is now curated by our friends um, who decide what news stories we read and in what order and what context. And the first thing you read is your friends comment about it. Um, telling you what they think about it. So um, the, the kind of, I think that the takeaway from, from the Obama campaign and from the way that our media is playing out in Australia um, is that it's not the, the medium at all, but rather the changing of the messenger um, that is most significant. Okay, Peter wants to jump in, but I did ask you a double-barreled question. The second half was what tricks, therefore, have you got up your sleeve that you <laughs> learned from Joe? So I'll come back to that. I haven't forgotten, and I'm not going to let you off the hook, Peter. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think um, we have to be we have to be careful about seeing some of this as wholly new. I mean, if, if we take that that mobilising your neighbour to talk to you. I mean, we used to know we used to have a term for this in the traditional mainstream media model, which was the two step flow, which was that you know the old fashioned media model wasn't that someone's you know Patty wrote something it got printed and it went straight into your brain, that it went into your brain in a social context, and what social media does is automates and reifies and makes visible the social context that has always existed around the way we consume media. What I think probably some of the, the uh, masters of the universe out of the United States won't talk about, of course, is sometimes it's more cost effective not to mobilise voters, but to demobilise voters. And I think that's got very negative implications for democratic practice too. What, sorry, what do you mean by demobilising? Well, sometimes you can win an election in the United States simply by getting out people who are going to vote for you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can win an election in the United States by discouraging people who are not going to vote for you from coming out. And how do you do that? Well, you can do things illegally, like disenfranchise African Americans. You can have uh, black bag groups uh, robocalling people and sending them to the wrong addresses so they can't vote. You can use negative campaigning to um, discourage people from participating in elections because you've um, soured people's feelings of all the candidates, and so only your keenest will come out. If you think you've got a core base that's bigger than your opponent's core base, if you demobilise everybody else, you'll win that election. So it's not all up. And of course, the other thing we've got to keep in mind is some of these strategies that we see in elections in the United States carry through in between. So Obama uses the We the People um, petition system to create massive uh, mailing lists. And what the Obama campaign does is they cut around the conventional media to go direct to the public. And if we do think there is a role for uh, the independent fact-checking function of journalists like yourself, 
we should have some concerns that these massively publicly resourced institutions are building the sort of political databases that allow them to go direct to the public. And I think, so I think there's like, you know, Obama's this great guy and he's all about change and we love him and everything like that, great big hug, hug, hug. But I think we've got to see that there are, that those techniques will also be used by people we don't like so much. And we have to say, do we really like it that politicians are going to cut journalists out of the loop? I wonder if an email from a friend telling you how to vote is any more effective than an ad on a television or a leaflet dropped in your letterbox, and that's a question I'll leave hanging. In fact, I'm sure there are people here with examples and anecdotes and contributions to make on that front as well, but I'm not letting Sam off the hook. What, what tricks has GetUp got up its sleeve for the next, what is it, uh, 15 weeks or something as we head towards an election on September mm. 14? Well, the first part of our plan is to um, disenfranchise as many African-American voters <laughs> as we can. And, um, and we're, set, we're setting up these robo-calling centres to direct people to vote at um, like tuck shops where they can't cast a ballot. <laughs> um, well, I mean, what, I think that the lesson about the messenger being important is, um, is, is a very good one to put into practice. So, for example, we'll be, um, we'll be, allowing, we'll, we'll be inviting people to make their own political TV ads this election. Um, you can Explain make your how own... This works. Traditionally, um, you know, we're going to be swamped with TV ads that are all made by the same five people, right? There are basically five people in the country who can make political TV ads. Um, we'll now see them on YouTube and all that sort of stuff, but they're basically made by the secretaries of the, of the various major parties and you know, maybe the ACTU and um, you know, the Business Council of Australia um, and the mining industry, you know. Um, and, um, but what this project is about is saying anybody can make a 30-second ad, make it about whatever you want, um, as long as it's not you know, wildly defamatory. Um, we'll put it on our website, people can vote for their favourite ones and we'll put the, most, um, you know, the, we'll put the best one on air. Um, we'll chip in together and fundraise and, and, um, and buy spots for it on TV and, and YouTube as well. Um, so you know, that, that kind of, the beauty of that kind of approach is that you know, one of them goes on air but the others are being forwarded around from their peers to their peers. Um, and I think that, that um, you know, that's, that's one iteration of that lesson about the messenger being important. So um, who will decide the winner of the advertising competition? Will it be the members of GetUp voting to choose which one is the most effective or the best ad? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then you'll use your, what, crowdsourcing and your own resources to put it on, for instance, free-to-air commercial television? Mm -hmm. Those are big bucks that you're going to be spending. Yeah, well, I mean, GetUp members have, um, have chipped in a lot of money to advertising campaigns before. In fact, um, you know, not outside of election years, you know, between federal elections, they have become the biggest progressive advertisers in the country. Um, you know, we were outspent in the last year, in terms of political advertising, we are outspent only by uh, the mining industry and the gambling industry, um, who had their own little agendas to push. Um, so it's, no, it's not small change that, um, you know, people are chipping in 50 bucks each, but when there are 100,000, there are 120,000 GetUp members who've donated over the years. Uh, and so together, that can, um, you know, that can make an impact. Okay, so little nuts and bolts things here. 30 second ads? Probably. Probably 30 second spots. Uh, and when's that going to be up and running? We'll be launching that in the next couple of weeks. Um, you just launched it now. <laughs> well, that's true. Um, we'll be launching the website in the next couple of weeks. I can't think of an equivalent where citizens could contribute to mainstream politics in any similar way ever. There's always been gatekeepers. Yeah. Um, in terms of making their own ads, yeah, I guess. I, I must admit I'm a bit of a fan of um, Hit the Streets and, you know, uh, get active um, through, you know, letter. I still believe in letter writing and I'm, and I'm sure that um, Get Up does too. Uh, and, you know, how many petitions have you launched and... Uh, but I also think it's interesting that the ultimate model relies on the mainstream media again. It does bring it back to advertising in the mainstream media. And, uh, and so the social side of it is only sort of part. And, and so we saw that with the mining tax. I mean, I made a note. I thought it was worth talking about the mining tax campaign. I don't know if that would look the same in 2013. I suppose we're about to find out. Uh, it but would probably look like the mining land use fax campaign that's going on right now. Right. With I don't a, know about that one. Which a, one is it? Uh, what is it? Mining. Le I can't believe I'm promoting the bloody mining industry's campaign. Um, but they're, you know, they're pulling out a similar campaign called Mining Land Use Facts, and they're saying, you know, greenie activists are telling you, you know, investigative journalists are telling you that um, the, the CSG oh, yeah, industry yeah. is doing all this. Yes, shit. yes, yes. 
And there's no social side to that, I don't think, either. I don't think that they're being particularly sophisticated, are they? It's just blank. It's just spending, you know, it's good campaigning and spending a lot of money. Uh, so I wonder, although I mean, there were another I was mentioning, you know, I've certainly had an experience of, um, of you know, Colsim Gas companies kind of setting up um, pro Colsim Gas Twitter accounts that, you know, then go and harass some, you know, um, sceptical journalists like me uh, about, you know, uh, whether I'm biased or straight on, you know, on the issues. And uh, so, so I suppose, the, you know, business is getting into social media and in that way. Oh, there's no doubt. Uh, almost all businesses, large businesses in Australia, now have in-house social media teams, whether it's breweries or gaming organisations or retailers or banks. Uh, they have, in fact, hidden bunkers with control centres looking like something out of NASA, and they monitor 24-7 in case something is some shitstorm's brewing that they're going to have to respond to and try and harness it, in fact. Uh, do any of you have insights into this? No? Well, I mean, probably... If I, if I could just pick up, actually, on what was said. I mean, if we think about the, the mining tax debate, that's a really good example of a debate we could have had about democracy. Because Kevin Rudd, he comes into government and he says, I don't like public sector advertising for political purposes, and he calls it a cancer on democracy, right? So he, to some extent, puts the kibosh on really partisan government advertising, the use of public money to buy ads to promote policy. And then he tries to introduce a major tax, and the industry only spend $10 million and do an end run around him. And I think what we've got to keep in mind is, you know, at the last election, the major political parties are being asked to spend 10 in 10. So they're being encouraged by people like Google to spend 10% of their campaign in the online space in 2010. So we are still talking about a minority. Most of this is focused on its impact on mainstream commercial media because, as you've pointed out, Australians have compulsory voting. Most people, with the exception of a big chunk of people 18 to 25-ish, uh, do enrol and do vote. And the people who are most susceptible to change their vote are the least informed. And so clearly, they're not going to come to you, your social media site. They're not going to join your Facebook group. They're not going to follow your Twitter hashtag. You have to push content at them. And how do you do that? Through mainstream. So there still is a logic in Australia that drives major political campaigning towards, and Get Up shows this, towards major ad buys. Yep. So we, we do need to put this into context a little bit. But in terms of the, the question about the, the nature of these kind of negative issues and how they, they emerge for organisations, clearly the speed at which the media system moves with things like Twitter means that issues solidify very quickly. And the old 24-hour turnaround cycle that your PR team might have been able to respond to is no longer acceptable. Issues will emerge and become concretised, be put on the front page of a newspaper, be repeated endlessly through social media, whether they're right or wrong, in hours, if not minutes. And this means that the speed at which everybody is responding to issues is going to be very quick. Now, this is sometimes good, that we can elicit a response from um, major institutional actors very quickly. So Maya, the CEO of Maya, makes a stupid statement about um, the funding of disability um, support and quickly is hosed down by social media. On the other time, if the facts are wrong, it gets solidified. And so we had in New South Wales a, a case of an altercation between a young man at, um, at the Mardi Gras and a police officer. Facebook particularly pushed, picked it up and showed the video and it went into the mainstream media as, you know, aggressive, overly aggressive, possibly homophobic cop assaults gay guy at Mardi Gras. Um, and that dominated the, the news story. But For how long? Oh, almost for a week, about four or five days. And then? And then new footage came out to show that actually the young guy had been aggressive, there might have been overreaction by the police officer, but it wasn't an, a police assault. And I think once upon a time, good journalism would have picked that up. On the other hand, once upon a time, no one would have given a shit what happened to a gay guy at Mardi Gras. Let's... <laughs> You know, the police should beat them up. I mean, we at the University of Sydney were teaching queer, queer studies when homosexual acts were still illegal. So there is this interesting tension, I think. Just for each of the members of the panel, uh, General Coney is still at large. It was sea shepherd and activism, direct activism, 
that saved whales rather than an online campaign. UNICEF recently put out a, a statement that uh, social media doesn't feed people, and that's not what ends starvation. Are you for real? Yeah. Oh. So, I know, I it's terrifying. I liked things that there was a direct connection to poor people being fed. Yeah. So, uh, do we have to at the same time, whilst we acknowledge, I mean, there's a certain amount of either fad or fashion element to all of this. The media love talking about media. changes to the media. Um, the media proprietors are obsessed with all this stuff. Uh, and yet, it's only a veneer across the top. It's not really, I don't really know that people at a pub in St Albans are sitting down comparing hashtags and Twitter accounts, working out what's going on. It's a very, almost an inner city elite uh, obsession. I, I don't think that's true. And I don't think it's a veneer either. I think it's, it's more akin to a ligament that, that, keep, that binds bigger things together. Um, you know, the, that while, that's, you know, while it's true that um, you know, clicking like on Facebook doesn't, um, doesn't feed people, thank you, UNICEF. Um, it's, it's also true that, for example, today we saw the, the Prime Minister of Turkey in the midst of huge protests um, across, across that country, like millions of people on the streets, and somebody shot yesterday in the midst of those protests. Um, it went on uh, in an interview and said um, that Twitter is the biggest curse in our country at the moment. Um, this is the Prime Minister of Turkey saying the biggest curse in our country at the moment is Twitter. Um, so, and it's also true that in the, in the midst of... Um, of similar protest movements in, in recent years, the first thing to be shut down is the internet. The first thing that, um, that uh, those governments do is ring the, um, the national broadband um, carrier and, and shut it down. Um, so you know, the, it's not, a, it's not a, just a veneer that sits atop something. It's actually a ligament that binds things together. And sure, it, it, by itself, a ligament doesn't do anything um, you know, amazing, but it allows other people to communicate and do other things. Well, what, what it is is a business to sell ads, isn't it? Isn't that what Facebook actually is? And it's feel like it's a bit of a cargo cult about social media. Well, you could say the same thing about newspapers, mate. I, I, sure. And, uh, and, and yet um, there was, you know, as a result, I think, partly of you know, the existence of classified ads that had no strings. There was grown up at newspapers, a culture that you were writing for the reader and there were no strings. You weren't uh, obliged just because, you know, someone wanted to sell their ute. Uh, you weren't a obliged to write a story about them or, or call them for comment. Um, you were just happily enjoying the money and, uh, and subsidising um, public interest journalism. And, uh, and okay, I'm not an expert on the Facebook business model, and I certainly don't understand the Twitter business model. But at the end of the day, the, um, the, these companies—and I'm terrified of Google. Uh, how much? I mean, I. This is a boring story, and I'll, so I'll make it short. But I just swapped from an iPhone to a, an Android phone, and the war between Apple, Telstra, Sony, and Google on uh, for possession of my data, my contacts, my emails, and everything else. I just I find, found that quite interesting, and I. And, uh, and I certainly don't, um, you know, we've had a big debate about whether Google pays enough tax here and elsewhere in the world. I mean, certainly don't believe the, um, um, you know, do no evil kind of motto carries much, much weight and, it, and they're getting an increasing penetration into um, my own personal, uh, you know, my own information. They know who I talk to, they know who my friends are. I mean, that's, I'm starting to get a, a little bit worried about it. Well, that's uh, another aspect, and privacy is another whole area we could delve into. We'll see where our audience questions take us as well. Hello, um, my name's Jennifer Rayner. I'm actually a researcher from the ANU, and I research elections and campaigning and, and that sort of thing, so very um, interested to hear what you all have to say. I'm interested in that question about participation and how you turn sort of online involvement into something that matters in the real world. In the 2010 election, there were about 1.4 million Australians who were either entitled to be on the rolls and weren't, or were were enrolled and didn't show up to vote. So I'm wondering, Peter perhaps could tell us a bit about why the conversation doesn't actually focus on turnout, turning online activism into turnout at the ballot box. And also, Sam, I suppose why that's not more of a focus for Get Up, because it seems like often your campaigns are about taking people in other directions other than that very formal participation on polling day. All right, Peter first. All right. Well, of course, Sam's going to say how in the last election they were instrumental in trying to re-enrol people. So. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, and, and affected significant institutional change in that way. And that's one of the wins I think we, we didn't talk about. But um, certainly, I mean, if we look at 
you know, if we do research on people who are politically active in social media, what we find is, unsurprisingly, they're politically active offline. And the question is, which comes first? Um, what we know is if we look at internet use and correlate it to political activity, it's a bit of a hockey stick. The more internet you use, the more you are politically active in the, off, in the, in the physical world until you reach a very high amount and then it tapers off, which basically until you reach a point where you spend so much time online you can't actually do any offline stuff. <laughs> now, um, so, so it's, not a, it's not a linear relationship. But what I'd say from my research in Australia, um, what we see is that the people who are politically active online are politically active offline. They're joiners by nature. The notion, Morozov's notion of clicktivism, the substitute activism that we get, where if you do all this online, you're no longer feeding the poor, you're, you're clicking about Coney and it's all a bit of a, a wank and a waste of time. That's not true, right? Um, if you, you extend your activism into all aspects of your life if you're an active person, you talk to your friends about politics, you talk to your co-workers about politics, and of course you do it online. It makes perfect sense. Why should the online be any different? But what that means, to flip it around of course, is if you're not active, we're not going to find you in those online activist spaces, and so you're not going to get your one point whatever million people who are particularly young and will end up being on the electoral roll at some point, particularly with automatic enrolment systems, over time. Um, but what I'd say is, what the social media campaigning of the, what I call the online social movement organisations like GetUp and its uh, sister organisations around the world, Move On uh, and the like, um, do is they have worked on this notion of building activist identities, right? So people who are members of GetUp get a sense that they are activists and through the communication back and forth with that organisation, they develop their activist personalities, their personas, and a degree of confidence. And I think if, and I think this is a, an open question to be honest, if GetUp manages to transition these people from online clicking and, and donating and passing on to the physical world, then they will have a bigger impact as they grow that activist base. Um, and in terms of de democracy, I think it's interesting because we've also seen counters to get up on the opposite side of the spectrum. So we see Can Do, what was originally the Conservative Action Network and is now the Community Action Network. And if you ask people who are members of that organisation why they joined, they joined because they wanted to be a counter to get up. So certainly the activism of get up is encouraging activism for other people on the other side. And that obviously is democratic in a way. Um, so that's my take. Sure. Sam? Um, Peter made my point already. Thanks, Peter. Um, but but no, it's true that there, are, there were at the last election 1.4 million people missing from the electoral roll in Australia, which is just over 10% of the eligible voters. Um, that will be, I think, a lot lower this time. Um, at the last election, we did two things, um, well, three things in that. One is get a member just went out and talked to their neighbours about are you enrolled to vote, are you enrolled to vote correctly, can, can we help you update your, your forms. Another was um, uh, a constitutional challenge to the, um, to the law that uh, made it difficult for people to enrol. It gave them one day to enrol to vote, which was actually practically impossible by all, um, for most people, and made that seven days instead. 169,000 people were added to the rolls because of that. Um, which, But that was nothing to do with online. Uh, no, but that court case was underwritten by um, by people by 10,000 people donating online. It was a $300,000 plus um, risk that we were taking on in um, funding a court case, which had we lost, we would have pay been paying costs of that could have bankrupted us. So that it was, we found actually it was online really because the, the two plaintiffs, two young people, we needed to find two young people who had tried to enrol and had failed, and we found them on Twitter by asking if anyone had this experience. And then we needed to underwrite the cost of, the, of a high court case, which we did by sending out an email and saying, is anyone willing to chip in and, and underwrite this thing? Which they were. Um, as a result of that, you know, in, 13, in the 13 most marginal electorates, the number of people who enrolled by that court case was larger than the difference between the parties. So those people changed the election result. Um, and the third thing that... that Sorry, um, say that again. In 13 seats... In the 13 most marginal electorates at the last... So the last election came down to one electorate. The closest was Karankamite, um, where I think Handful it was of votes, yeah. seven, 70 votes or something like that, 69. Um, in that electorate, there were over 1,100 people who were added to the roll who were able to vote because of that court case, right? 16, so 70 people was the difference, 1,100 people because of that court case. There were 13 electorates, 13 most marginal, where the number of people enrolled by the court case was larger than the difference between the two major parties. So 
enrollment changes elections, it changed the last one. Um, the last thing we did was, um, was try to make it possible for people to enroll to vote online. Because um, you can't do that in Australia. Um, you know, you can open a bank account, um, you can make a passport application, but you couldn't enroll online. Um, so we built a website where people could enroll online. Uh, we had to hack it because the AEC, um, the Electoral Commission, would only accept enrollment forms by fax. Um, and, um, and so we built a website, this is a fact, where you could um, type your details in to an enrollment form, and we used some technology to render that onto, um, onto a, a PDF. You could sign it with your mouse, but render that onto a PDF, and then we would actually fax your form um, to the Electoral Commission so they could accept it by the 1980s technology. And they were using, um, I, I give the AEC a bit of um, stick for this, but they actually do a great job um, overall. So, the AC then sued us and said, no, you can't, <laughs> you can't do that. So I'm trying to do your job for you, but better. Um, give, give, <laughs> give me a break. They sued us anyway, so, um, so we took them to the federal court and, um, and we won. We beat the AC twice that year. Um, it was a bad year for the AC's legal team. Um, but we only got to enroll one person using that website. It was the plaintiff in the case. Um, so here's another exclusive for you, John. Um, in, the next, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be launching um, that enrollment website again, where people will now actually, without being sued, be able to, without me being sued, be able to enroll to vote online. Um, but there are, you know, there are still a million people missing. It, I think you'll find that this election Sorry, is dramatically lower. You're doing that through GetUp, or the Electoral Commission are going to do that? Well, um, I hope that the Electoral Commission are going to do it. We have been asking them since the last election to roll out their own site, because obviously it's better people enrolling with the AC than... A whole lot better. ...than through me. Um, I could, hypothetically, although I'm, I'm not, be um, directing them to the wrong polling booth or um, seeing if their names look um, like they're African-American and, and just um, kiboshing their enrolments. But I, I'm not doing that. Um, so I hope that the AEC will launch their own online enrolment site before the election. But if they don't, then we will. Okay, interesting. Peter was waving his hand. Yep. I'll come to you in a minute, though, Peter, because we've got lots of other oh, questions. Well, I mean, just we could just the AEC have done that, and that site is now up, so you can direct your unenrolled friends to the AEC site to. So you enrol can, them. You can update, for this election, you can, enrol from fresh. you can enrol. For this election, you think you can enrol online? I think so. Instead of having to do it at the post office. Yeah. Possibly. We will check out. If anybody yeah. knows, we'd love to know. If you can tweet someone who knows and get them to tweet back to us, <laughs> we'd like, at we'd like that Dyer. as well. I could get my phone out and sort this out. In fact, we could probably <laughs> well, okay. ring someone from the Electoral Commission, but in the meantime, I'll come to you next, but first question there, and then we'll carve it up between you. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name's Josie Swords, and I've got a question about that clicktivism idea of when people are, you know, get passionate about an issue that's just come up in current affairs, they go online. So organisations like Destroy the Joint are really good at mobilising all of that energy and sometimes all of that outrage. I was wondering, in the context of the um, Julie Gillard's sex and sexism and misogyny speech, I have always wondered what, why that didn't necessarily translate into any more concrete action or any activity to address the representation of women in leadership and particularly in Australian Parliament. I think people forget that um, Gillard was responding to um, Abbott uh, and who was accusing her of misogyny, uh, which was just, she couldn't stomach. Uh, I, I, I didn't think that she intended to set up, you know, a campaign about um, women in power or do anything in particular about it, but she just couldn't stomach accusations of misogyny coming from Tony Abbott over you know, a failure to respond to comments made by Peter Slipper, and, um, and it all got too much and she let go. Um, I don't know that necessarily, I mean, obviously there was, I mean, at, at the Herald, uh, we certainly kind of, everybody Sorry, the was, Herald, the Sydney, the Sydney Morning, Morning Herald, Herald, you know, and there was certainly a lot of discussion about shit, how did the press gallery miss that? Uh, but yeah, I don't, I mean, I suppose I'm, I don't have an answer for your question particularly, but I don't, but, uh, yeah, it was a it was a um, it was a wake up certainly a wake up call for the press gallery. I think that um, I think that it did actually um, spark uh, that that speech did actually spark um, quite a shift in um, in social media and in, in activism. It's, uh, it inspired the destroy the joint movement, which I think is um, is at the cutting edge of of kind of leaderless um, uh, information sharing movements in Australia. And, um, and it became, you know, a real 
kind of um, call to arms. I, I think that um, what we haven't seen yet is that kind of passionate uh, kind of uh, outrage turn into become institutionalized. Is that what Peter was talking about earlier? Is that you know these social social media moments um, are a little bit like those protest moments I was talking about as the foundation of Get Up, where people come out in the streets and they're bloody pissed off. Um, and uh, there becomes a point when there are enough of those moments and somebody binds them together with with um, something that turns moments into a movement. Um, and I think what, what hasn't fully happened yet, um, although Destroy the Joint is um, is starting to do it, um, is that um, that becomes that those that outrage becomes kind of institutionalized into a social movement which is coordinated um, and has a way to to um, to uh, continue to build power um, and I think that um, you know there are some people who have been working over the last little while on building that kind of online movement for women's activism in Australia uh, and I think that that will be um, that will happen over the next next year all right and you can see on the Twitter feed here that some people have been checking websites and you can update your address, check your enrolment details, complete a registration form online. I think that but means you, you can print it off, yep. complete it, and send it in. By I've, I've uh, using old technology, <laughs> sent a text to the Electoral Commission's <laughs> media officer. I don't yet have a response. I don't know if it's 7.39 on a Tuesday night while I'm at a public forum, whether Steve is prepared to respond. We'll find out. We'll find out soon. Please, yeah. go ahead. Oh, sorry, just on that one. Yeah, sure, I, Peter. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I mean, what, what I think I think is is useful to say about say destroy the joint, um, and also the misogyny speech. I mean I think the, mis the 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 reaction in social media to the misogyny speech shows, for right or wrong, and certainly people in the press gallery defend their interpretation of that um, as a far more cynical exercise by saying no, we are contextualising it, and this is the truth of the situation. So that's their position. But what it what it shows is clearly how a range of institutions that once felt they were um, beyond public scrutiny because they were the ultimate arbitrators of the public interest, like media organisations, are now subject to scrutiny by the public directly. And we've seen successive waves of this as you know, church organisations, as academic organisations, as medical institutions. You know, we've had the end of the God Doctor, we've had the end of the God Professor, why shouldn't we have the end of the God editor and sub-editor model? And that is through social media. So I think that's, that is a powerful kind of factor. Well, the, can I say why not? Well, shall I get on to the... No? OK. Yeah, yeah let's fight. Well, just in defence of the traditional newsroom, there's, you can have a million bloggers, uh, but they can all be sued. Uh, they've got no financial wherewithal, uh, particularly just your house on the line with every story that you publish. And not only that, the, work, the genius of a newsroom is that you share leads, you share contacts, you work together on stories, you work together on the big stories. You, can't, you cannot replace, and I, uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to be seen as a dinosaur, but you can't replace the impact and, um, uh, uh, you know, weight of a, a, a traditional newsroom. And the readers will say, I don't need what this... Um, you know, Fairfax is putting out, and then regret it when it's gone because uh, you, you need it. You cannot do the same sort of journalism by yourself. Yeah, and the, the disadvantage of the, the 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 traditional, you know, commercial media venture is that if something skips that filter, if something isn't deemed as newsworthy then it just disappears from the scene. And so the, those are the flip side of any institution, the advantages and the disadvantages. I mean, I see a future where these kind of institutional, uh, you know, media producing organisations benefit from the social media. Absolutely. Um, but certainly it does take, and we all feel it. I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I'm standing in class. Ten years ago I stand in class and I give a lecture and I walk out of the room. Now all my students are tweeting about the lecture, about things I've got wrong or what I'm wearing and things like that. And I'm supposed to decide. I mark their essays, the little <laughs> bastards, and now they're... And sometimes, you know, often they are wrong, but sometimes like they're right. And a student the other day tweeted, well, why aren't you talking about this particular aspect of journalism? Sunshine journalism, we were giving a lecture on war reporting. Why didn't you talk about peace journalism? And it's like, I didn't, you know? And I was like, you are dead right. And hopefully I can get to the point with my students where I can say, you know, hopefully I'm a bit of an expert, but yeah, I'm going to benefit from this material. But if we can just get back to destroy the joint, 
where Destroy the Joint, I think, differs from other um, social media campaigns is it is the reactivation of a pre-existing social movement, it's feminist movement. It's not wholly new under the sun. The reason why Destroy the Joint can mobilise so quickly, can marshal arguments so effectively, is because of the cultural turn in social movement politics. Because feminism has a huge history, people understand the, the issues of feminism, and that pre-existing social movement. So this is not a question of whether Destroy the Joint can emerge and solidify as a social movement. It is the expression, the pre-existing expression of a social movement. It need not form an institutional basis for that social movement to continue, just as we saw with slut walks. Slut walks is another example of, you know, a quite postmodernist expression of the feminist movement, whether we agree with it or not. We get one month we have a police officer say to a young woman in Toronto, you women shouldn't dress like sluts if you don't want to get raped. One month later, you've got protests across Canada. A month after that, you've got protests in Melbourne. You've got protests in Delhi. But that's because of that pre-existing social movement of feminism. We have so much to thank Alan Jones for, not just <laughs> destroy the joint. Yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Christine. Um, I am actually a Get Up member, and I'd like to direct uh, my question at uh, Sam in the first instance, although Patty may also have something to add from a media perspective. Um, I am wondering uh, how much you think the popularity of Get Up um, is simply a reflection um, of people being frustrated that their views or their concerns are not um, being heard uh, or being reflected uh, through their politicians, their representatives, or through uh, the mainstream media. And I'm interested in, um, I guess, GetUp's experiences with uh, media entities and politicians. You know, some of the responses there seem to be a little bit grudging um, and slow um, to get on board with this sort of thing or recognise its uh, importance to a lot of people. Um, and I guess what that sort of um, means for, say, the long-term future of an organisation like GetUp, if there are uh, resultant, um, you know, changes or, you know, getting in with the times that come through the media or our politicians. That's a very good question. I'm tempted to throw, back the, throw the first one back to you and ask um, if... Um, if frustration with the political parties is why you're, you take action through GetUp. Uh, yes, and I put that in my survey that you sent out today. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that's a common experience, is that, is that um, you know, uh, I think you know, my generation get a lot of slack for being um, apathetic and, and lazy and not joining political parties. Um, but um, and I, I get very frustrated when people bring up this this, uh, this term about slacktivism, um, as if um, signing something online or, or making a phone call or, or making a donation is something to be disparaged. Because you know, what's actually going on there is people are looking for ways to engage in politics, and the fact that they couldn't find another way that they haven't joined a political party um, and instead they're taking action online is not a reflection of a bad reflection on online activism. It's a bad reflection on all on the other means, the traditional means, um, that people uh, would, you know, are looking to take action through. Um, on the second point about um, about the reception uh, that GetUp members receive uh, among uh, politicians, elected politicians, I think um, that we've seen a, a pretty diverse range of responses. Um, they range from the, the kind of... Uh, some senators who have gotten up and compared um, GetUp members to Hitler Youth um, in parliamentary speeches and said, oh, bloody GetUp members, they're, they're the, you know, like the, the Nazi youth of, of today, um, to which we received um, a flood of donations from our members who are, um, who are um, among whom old people and Jewish people are well overrepresented. Um, so thank you for the, um, so thank, thank you for the great fundraiser, um, Ian McDonald. Um, there are those types of responses, and there are um, people on both kind of sides of politics and in all parties. Um, and I think Malcolm Turnbull on the Liberal side, I would think, I think is the best. And Andrew Lee, um, uh, Labor MP, is probably the best I've seen on the Labor side, who really understand uh, what social movements are about and what power they have and how to use them um, to their own political advantage. Essentially, you know, I can't believe that more politicians don't understand what Malcolm Turnbull understood very quickly, which is that if you start getting a get up campaign against you and you're getting, you know, there are 13,000 um, get up. Members, people who receive GetUp emails in his electorate of Wentworth. That's about one in six 
voters. He starts getting about half of those emailing him complaining about something. That is the, how, it's free email addresses. The people are emailing you from within your electorate saying, dear Malcolm, I would like to talk to you about this issue about climate change. It's a, it's a silver platter to write back to those people and say, dear Judy, thank you so much for your email. Um, I'm holding a public forum to discuss it. Let me charm you and tell you all about my climate change policy. I can't believe that nobody that other politicians have not understood um, the opportunity that exists in social movements like that um, to, um, to harness them and, um, and use them as opportunities to in increase participation, increase engagement, and increase um, their audience. So if you got a daily or weekly newsletter from your local member of parliament in your inbox, are you telling me you'd actually read it? <laughs> well, the best of them don't send those anymore. <laughs> um, the, best, the best MPs that I've seen using social media don't, don't send the traditional, oh, let's take the PDF of our, um, our postal um, newsletter and send it out. Um, and people like the MPs I just mentioned um, are using them to are using their staff benefits to employ young people to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who email them in their electorate um, and to email not a newsletter but a um, Dear John, I know that you're concerned about um, funding cuts to the ABC. Um, let's have a conversation about that. And that's incredibly labour intensive, as we've already learned. Yeah, it shows how, many few, how few emails they get. I mean, Beasley, when he was uh, the leader of the ALP, he tried to do this uh, during an election where he'd have uh, ALP people email back to every email they got, and they just didn't have enough people. I mean, yeah. I mean, get-ups and that are replacing the mass party model, but parties found in the Australian situation where TV advertising wins. It's better to have money than people. And, you know, that is part of their problem, but it is part of the brutal logic of the system that they're in. Um, and that's why, you know, the get-ups are dealing with cartel parties, and the cartel parties can use public funding to outspend them every day of the week. It's not that, it's not that um, staff intensive. If they think they get a lot of email, try sending out 660,000 emails um, to people four times a week and getting all the people who reply to correct your grammar and having to reply to each of them. It's not like, believe me, they don't get that much email compared to us, and you can deal with it. Yeah, yeah, but your examples are unusual examples. I mean, the average member of parliament uh, has one or two staff members, they have a little office, and most of the time what they deal with is constituents who wander in and say, my benefit's been cut off, can you investigate that? And they are going to respond to those as a matter of priority. They don't have the sort of systems because they're not encouraged by their parties. And as we see in the next federal election, I mean, uh, liberal candidates are being told by the central party machine not to use social media because they think it's more trouble than it's worth. And this is... Because, because their candidates are nutters who say no, crazy no, things. This, no, no. Is, this is the... Um, I, th I, think, I think if that's our view of, of parliamentarians, then I wonder why we spend so much time talking about them. But no, it's because actually, and Paddy might not like this, if you're a minor MP, the only time you're going to get on the front page of the City Morning Herald is when you get your cock out on social media. Or when you're like Pauline Hanson and you say Asians should all be sent back because they smell funny. And there's no benefit, there's no benefit to social media for most of them. But your average football club has more members than our major political, than our major political yeah, parties poli and probably use social media more effectively than our political yeah, parties. Yeah, but political parties don't want members. Uh, that's, the, that's the modern, that's the modern, uh, modern model of campaigning. It's, it's the mass centralised campaigning. It's the, they it's need members for a whole lot of reasons, including money. handing out how to vote brochures. Um, they need it for the legitimacy that comes from it. They need it in order to fill up their forums and provide them with the breadth of experience and to recruit people to do all the well, that, dreadful that's, jury that's the tasks. Argument, that's the argument that we hear. But if we think about you know, Gould's unfinished revolution, the kind of new Labor model that has, in, you know, infiltrated all of the, all of the parties around the world, really, in the kind of uh, Anglo sphere. It is centralised campaigns, high-level strategies agreed earlier, professional techniques, the use of money and singular messaging. And unlike the United States, where you have a more diversified polity, they don't vary from that script. Now, I'm not saying that's right, and that creates some of the problems that they have, but it certainly is the dominant political logic of the day, and the centralised mass media system does encourage that to some extent. We'll have our last question first, and thank you. Great. Uh, good evening. My name is Craig Lambie. I'm a technologist. I'm also a member of GetUp, and I'm a member of CanDo, just to see what they were up to. <laughs> 
Um, my question actually leads on to the last discussion, and it's about uh, the letter writing. Uh, it's to you, Patty, um, and maybe Sam will have a comment as well. The, uh, I find that letter writing is very uh, non-transparent, as in sending a letter to your MP, you don't know who else has said the same sorts of things. They will probably send you back a form letter, uh, which indicates that a few other people have the same opinion, but there's no way of telling how many other people in your electorate have that opinion. So wouldn't a, a get-up style or a online system that allows uh, true measurement be a better option? Uh, did you say there was a great um, Bernard Keane piece on how to really write a letter that really stuffed um, you know, the relevant minister and their department, and particularly if you CC'd another junior minister and got two departments corresponding about. So there was a, it was a terrific, I don't know how to dig it up on Google, but it was a terrific exposition because I did work actually in the um, unit once of a New South Wales government department answering correspondence. And, and I came to think that, oh, you know, this does actually, you know, from my inside of the bureaucracy, um, think that, no, this does um, really put, keep people on their toes. Now, that's, that's, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I guess. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, oh, look, I've, I've got, I, I suppose I have a reservation that um, an, an online petition that's um, exactly the same that bombards um, inboxes doesn't necessarily get counted as, as much as, a, as an old-fashioned letter, um, but I, that might be just my generation. I, I uh, absolutely applaud GetUp's activism and, um, and energy and techniques, and so uh, whether it's more transparent... I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I suppose I'm saying that, uh, you know, getting... A, and it's not just writing to MPs, it's writing to companies, uh, you know, it, it's writing to the, um, to the newspaper. Uh, you know, I just think it's an act of citizenship that um, is, you know, better than people doing nothing. And uh, so I... Um, but at the end of the day... Um, yeah, I, I, I still hanker for the good old um, march down the street uh, myself and, um, and I've been waiting. I went on one global warming walk in 2009 which really felt like, yes, there's something starting to happen here that's really going to change, uh, you know, the debate. And, uh, you know, just like the, um, you know, reckon the Sorry Day walk, did or even to, uh, even though the, the marches failed on the uh, Iraq war, still nevertheless, uh, you can't say that didn't have an impact. It did, and um, and so I've been waiting and waiting for the um, what should be, you know, a can't I can't think of an issue that has more public uh, interest and importance than climate, and yet we have we're sort of docile and uh, allowing this debate to go backwards rather than forwards, and I, I just think objectively we're failing uh, and we need to get uh, active again in a new way and I don't, um, you know, and I'd like to see us rediscover the energy that, you know, probably my parents had uh, in the 60s that was really actually turning things upside down and, um, and that's what I'm hoping to see, I suppose. Uh, there was that great Whitlam dismissal docu or not Whitlam dismissal, Whitlam documentary that was two-parter on the ABC, which was, it, it almost made you nostalgic for that level of grassroots uh, reaction that you saw in the archival yeah. footage there. It was amazing. But <laughs> if all letters get published for everyone to see what everyone else writes, I mean, I, I can assure you there's no way I could publish most of the correspondence that comes to me at the ABC and you wouldn't want to read it, unless you're a particularly sick sort of puppy. Uh, I mean, it is extraordinary, and the, the, the content of it, a lot of it's deranged and mad and wrong, and that's why only some letters get published in the paper. Yeah, but I mean... Half, I guess, is the problem there. Hey? The bottom half, as like on all the, the news outlets, uh, you know, if they allow comments at all, turns into absolute drivel a lot of the time. So sure. some sort of uh, media oversight, maybe. No, Our but, time but, is nearly but, up, sorry, Peter. But, I'll give you a moment to sum up in a sec. Our time is nearly up, and it's a brave man who stands between an audience <laughs> and their dinner, and I don't intend to be that brave man. Um, in reverse order, I'll give you each a couple of minutes to do a summing up, reminding you that our topic was the people's voice, 
social media, instrument for change or just a lot of noise? Peter. I've spoken enough. No, go on. <laughs> Use your time. Oh. Um, the answer, I think, is yes. The answer is yes. I mean, I, I do take, uh, I do take uh, umbrage with the... Uh, sometimes I hear that things were better in the 60s and stuff like that, and only if we had the... Um, I'm not that old. The, the, spirit, the, <laughs> the spirit of the anti-war Vietnam protesters. Well, we probably would if we were actually subject to conscription have that. It was an incredibly self-interested time. And I, so some of that stuff I, I think we've got to take with a bit of a, a pinch of salt. I think like everything, there are, there are goods and bads and it's about thinking about the implications. But I guess probably the biggest implication has been the political economy effect on mainstream institutions, both political parties over many years, now media organisations and I think in the future uh, universities. And if we think these institutions are important, You've certainly expressed the view that political parties in their old-fashioned form are important. You've certainly expressed the view that uh, conventional media organisations are important. I believe universities are important. Then I think that we can see how there's been a knocking over of these institutions in society. Not all institutions are inherently bad and problematic, but certainly there is renewal through getting some of the power of the social which GetUp, I think, represents. Terrific. Thank you, Peter. Paddy. Uh, yeah, I don't want to be too gloomy. I sound gloomy, but I don't want to be too gloomy about the future of the media. And uh, and uh, all those generalisation, nevertheless, um, you know, you know, the audience for the Age and the Sydney Morning Herald is growing online, and um, they're investing heavily in new platforms and their work, and that and those are working. And there's a lot of excellent journalists uh, doing uh, terrific reporting uh, still at those papers and others in Australia. And you know, we've by and large pretty. Oh, actually, I can't say that with a straight face. But I, was, you know, <laughs> I, can't, I can't say we're well served in particular because I think that you know there are, we're, we're manifestly failing on on a number of issues. Uh, but that's just my personal view, I suppose. And uh, and in my particular experience uh, of business journalism and what I have to contribute to this debate is but is basically to tell you uh, that we are finding it, me and my colleagues, finding it increasingly difficult. Uh, to get up stories that have a major public importance about you know business in this country, and in particular, I'm thinking of uh, the mining industry, and in particular, I'm thinking of issues like climate and the mining tax, where even five, three years later we're going, oh, geez, the revenue, the revenue's collapsed. You know, why is that? Why, why are we so short of funds? And um, and it was that mining tax debate came and went. I think in you know a space of two months, and I think most Australians are still scratching their heads about. Well, hang on, I would have supported a mining tax that um, uh, you know provided a greater contribution to the resources industry to the economy, uh, but somehow that was all completely uh, you know derailed and. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, but nevertheless, I'm not uh, completely pessimistic and um, I'm certainly not, res I'm continuing to, um, you know, uh, fight the good fight. So thank you very much for um, turning up. Sam? Well, I was going to say the same thing, Paddy, that, uh, you know, often these discussions can, can feel quite depressing uh, when, you're, uh, when you're thinking about, um, about the state of, uh, you know, about some of the, some of the threats to our media. Um, and I, I, I don't think we should be depressed. I think we should leave feeling hopeful of, of um, you know, it's a bit of a, an honour to be sitting next to Paddy um, and, uh, and know how important his, um, his work has been in, in the coal seam gas space, for example, over the last couple of years. And I think that we can see a future where, um, where our media and our online movements come together and, are kind of, and reinforce each other, where all of us who benefit from that kind of investigative journalist Journalism can um, can fund and underwrite um, that kind of that kind of work directly. Um, where when journalists um, you know are threatened by by lawsuits as as Patty has been as you know Adele Ferguson is being right now in, in um, right here um, that um, that we all can stand behind them using um, you know social media and, and using online as a as a way to organise. Um, and I think that um, you know, the f the future for that is is bright. It, there are there are there are challenges. Um, there's a challenge of you know, developing filter bubbles, uh, as um, my colleague Eli from, from Move On refers to it. It's a, a great speech if you want to look it up about um, you know, the, the bubbles of information that we end, find ourselves in online where we're talking to people who are just like us. Um, there are important challenges there, but um, God, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of opportunity too. 
Well, the future is always bright when 250 to 300 people are prepared to come out on a wintry evening and even consider these issues, engage with these issues, and be the most active citizens you possibly can be. So I salute you all for coming along. Uh, Julie Roberts from RMIT will move the formal vote of thanks to the panel, and thank you very much, Julie. That was just wonderful. Uh, I, I don't even know where to, where to start in terms of uh, thought-provoking and, and insightful. And in a space where there's a lot of superficiality, a lot of noise, it was just wonderfully enriching to hear some real analysis and some real depth. And a couple of things struck me, how much we need each of the institutions or the, or the roles that you guys uh, represent, the, the media, um, journalism, radio, we need our activists and we need our universities and these are all really important to hang on to and I agree with John. I mean, thank you all for coming here tonight and listening to what I hope you agree is a really enriching discussion. It also occurred to me, it'd be really interesting to revisit in a couple of years because the sense that came through to me a lot was we're still in really early stages with all of this. We really don't quite know exactly where we're going to end up with all the changes that are being brought by these, these massive new technologies. And I mean, it really is, as, as you described, Patty, it's really hitting to the basic business models of many of the institutions that we've relied on for so long. So there's going to be tremendous change. Um, Peter and I have already talked about the, the impact on universities and what might happen there. John, thank you so much for leading the discussion so wonderfully well tonight. Um, and we, I think we could have gone on for hours. So thank you all very much. That was absolutely fantastic. And thank you.